Brothers and sisters in Islam, some weeks ago, <coughs> whenever I was giving khutbah here in this masjid, I actually started following a series of talks about happiness, about happiness. And we have already uh, covered a few khutbahs on those. And I mentioned that if somebody would want to think about a definition for happiness, you, you're not really going to find that <clears throat> all people in the world agree on a specific definition. But my own understanding from happy, what happiness is, happiness is that people are able to run their life in the most optimum way. We do not say in the perfect way because there is no perfection in this life. Perfection is only in Al Jannah. How to do things in the best way possible. How to run your own life as a human being to start with in the, in the most optimum way, your own life. And you need to understand who you are. You have so many requirements to fulfill your own, your own self. You have a body that Islam tells you you need to meet the requirements of your body. You have a soul. In addition, people say that we have a heart and also we have a mind, we have a brain. And then how can you deal with the people around you, starting from the closest family and going outwards in bigger circles? How do you deal with, if, are you able to deal with people in the most optimum way? Or are you facing problem in every way you deal with people? If you do not know how to deal with people, then you're going to be putting yourself in trouble every single day, and that's not happy. That's not happiness. So, are you able to run your entire life in this world in the most optimum way or not? <clears throat> What's the guidance? Tell me. People are searching really for that guidance and that's why if you go to the YouTube or you know, you find so many people talking about happiness, they address, you know, do this and you'll be happy, do that and you'll be happy. And then people are collecting from here and there. But where is that complete guidance? No one has complete guidance for human beings in their life except the religion of Islam. And we can confidently claim that as Muslims. Islam is the only religion or belief in the whole world that provides its followers with a complete way of life. It's the only religion that has the detailed catalog functioning catalog of the human beings. Islam, the complete way of life, gives us guidance in how to happily manage our life. And how to happily manage our life in every, every aspect of our life. How do I happily manage my own self? How do I happily manage my life with my wife? How does the wife happily manage her life with her husband? How do we happily manage our life with our children? This is going to be my topic today. And I'm going to start with the teenage children. So the topic today is how to happily raise our teenage children taking the guidance from Islam. And I'm hoping that after this khutbah, some people would pick maybe one item or two and they would say, yeah, this is really what I was missing in raising my teenage child and I'm sure that this is what will make me a happier parent with him and he will make him a happier parent with me, a happier child with me. And we will be referring to Islam in giving us those directions. 
So, what is the definition of the adolescence period, فترة المراهقة, the teenage? Some people say that it is the age period between reaching the biological sexual puberty and reaching the mental puberty, uh, the, the mental maturity or adulthood. I'll repeat. It is the age period between reaching the biological sexual puberty and reaching the mental maturity, adulthood. It is the transition period between childhood and adulthood. The symptoms of that period, which is considered to be the challenging period in, in raising our children, sometimes it even starts before puberty. Sometimes it starts as early as 11, and sometimes it continues to the age of 21. And in this case, it will really be, you know, it will be something that has taken, you know, longer than it should have. People are puzzled <coughs> in analyzing the personality of their teenage children. Now, my apologies to the teenage children who are here, and we do not really mean that all of the teenage children, <coughs> you know, uh, actually uh, pose a, a problem to their parents. We do not say that at all. In fact, I can confidently say that the teenage children who come to the masjid are really distinguished, they are really special. And, uh, but everybody knows that this age period, there are so many children that would really uh, give, you know, cause a big challenge to their parents. And th 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 this, these are the children we're addressing, so we're not really making the whole thing general. Even if I say it, where it may sound to be general, please don't take it to be as such. <clears throat> I was once part of a discussion, three people, everyone talking about his own experience with his e teenage child. <clears throat> One said, nothing works with them except with, you know, a, a endless argument. Anything, it just has to be an endless argument. I say and he replies, I say and he replies, I say an en endless argument. His friend said, well, in this argument, meaning that you are saying he is hearing and he is saying and you're hearing him, two people are talking to one another. In my case, he said, it's a one-way street. He doesn't listen to anything I say. He only listens to what's in his head. The third one said, actually, my son listens very well. Third one said, actually, my son listens very well. And he hears from me all what I say to him, nodding his head as a gesture of understanding. But he still goes and does what's in his head anyway. Islam teaches us to raise our children in a way that suits their own lifetime. This is one lesson to all of us who have teenage children. Listen to that. These are teachings of Islam. Islam teaches us to raise our children in a way that suits their own lifetime. Islam teaches us to raise our children in a way Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu is quoted to have said, Rabbu abna'akum li zamanin ghayri zamanikum. Raise your children and qualify them, underline, qualify them for a time that is different from your own time. He's also quoted to have said, La tukrihu abna'akum ala adatikum fa innahum khuliqu li zamanin ghayri zamanikum. Do not force your children to adopt your own habits and practices for they have been created for a time that is different from your own time. And do not be surprised that if your children have completely different thinking, in fact, opposite thinking about certain things, you need to accept that. I need to accept that. 
Let me tell you this funny story. In his book called Al Ab, The Father, Sheikh Abdul Salam Al Basuni, who is very well known, one of the very respectable scholars, he works here in Fanar. He wrote this experience with one of his children when his child was a teenage child. <clears throat> he published it in the book called Al Ab, and once even. I called him and said, Sheikh Abdul Salam, can I quote your experience? He said, yeah, I published it in my book. So he talks about his own experience with his son to show that let us not be surprised if our children have different thinking about certain things. He said, once I was in a travel abroad and his son, you know, his feet are big, I think they require like 40 size shoes, 47, and, and you can't find the style that, you know, that his son likes here in Qatar. So when he was abroad, that was the chance to get his son the style that really his son would like. So he said to his son, he said, son, how do you like for it to be? A shoes, a pair of shoes. I don't know the style that your generation likes. You know, he called his son on the phone. How, how do you like it to be? His son replied, it's very simple, Dad. Just identify the style that you will like the best and get me a different one. He said, it took me a few seconds of astonishment. But I then realized what he said. I left swallowing the reality and its truth. And I asked Allah to help us in raising this generation. It's true. We have to allow them space. My son always keeps telling me, Dad, allow us space. Allow us space for maneuvering, for moving. Don't constrict us. This is what Islam teaches us. Also, Ali ibn Abi Talib is quoted to have said, خاطب الناس على قدر عقولهم أتحبون أن يكذب الله ورسوله Talk to people in accordance with their level of comprehension. That applies to our teenage children. Talk to people according to, the, to their level of comprehension. Failing that could cause people to ignorantly reject the commands of Allah and His Messenger. You go to your son and, or your daughter and just you know, out of, you know, being precautionary, you know, you make, you make things haram, 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 you know, just to make sure he doesn't slip. At the end of the day, they will reject the commands of Islam, and we would be the cause, because we did not talk to them the right way. We did not present Islam the right way to them. We would be the ones to, to blame when they go far away from Islam. Remember, when we quote Ali ibn Abi Talib or Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, which I will quote now, they picked up all of that from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud also is quoted to have said, مَا أَنْتَ مُحَدِّثًا قَوْمًا حَدِيثًا لَا تَبْلُغُهُ عُقُولُهُمْ إِلَّا كَانَ لِبَعْضِهِمْ فِتْنَةً He said, talking to people, and now specifically we're talking about the teenage children, right? Talking to people in a manner they cannot comprehend could become a cause of affliction, could become a cause of trouble, a cause of misguidance to some of them as a result of their lack of understanding, meaning could cause some of them to adopt radical beliefs or commit wrong actions, thinking that they are literally implementing the religion's commands which they heard from you. Let us admit our deficiencies as parents so that we would correct them. Many times we see clear failure of the parents to establish proper dialogue with their own children. A lot of times when they talk, we hear them, but we do not listen to them. There is a difference between hearing and listening. When they talk, a lot of times we hear them, but we don't really listen to them. 
Once I talked to my own daughter, I was coming here to make a lecture <coughs> like that when she was a teenager, and I told her, what, what message would you think parents should be given? <coughs> she said, Dad, we want you to speak to us in a way that would enable us to, to, uh, uh, to, to comprehend what, and to be convinced with what you say. We want you to talk to us in a, in a, in a way that would convince us. Not just say, haram, aib, haram, aib. For everything is haram, aib, not allowed, mamnu'ah. Haram, aib, not allowed, mamnu'ah. Not talk to us in a way that we would be able to understand. Haram is something which is religiously prohibited. Aib, in Arabic, it means something which is culturally inappropriate. And you'll be surprised that so many times <clears throat> there are so many things that we consider aib, culturally inappropriate that are perfectly okay according to the religion of Islam. It's just that our bad cultures made them not allowed. And that would require a whole dedicated khutbah. Adolescence or teenage is the age of haste in making decisions and then exaggeration in actions and emotions. Let us take a very simple example and a very common example to give, to give you an example of something that our teenage children adopt and they exaggerate. And then that becomes a way of suffering for us. It is the exaggeration or addiction that they develop to what we call screen time or the use of their mobile phones and the internet, which has become a nightmare to many parents and families. Many parents complain, our children are living in the world of their mobile phones and internet. They no longer socialize or talk to us or to their brothers and sisters. Their exaggeration in the usage of their mobile phones has practically devastated the family ties within our family. That's what many parents say. They ask, what should we do? How can we address this problem? Let us first admit that our children's time indeed faces many more challenges and psychological influences than our time. The internet and mobile phones technologies have indeed helped the very far to become very near. But they also caused the very near to become very far. They have also caused the very near to become very far. And I hope it would not be taken like I'm against technology or anything like that. No Muslim can, can say that. I'm just asking that we utilize this excellent technology in the best way. That's all we're saying here. And that's what we, how can I get my child to use this technology in the best way? This is what I'm addressing. One of the teenage children once said, one time the electricity was cut off from our home for 24 hours, where we could no longer access the internet and our mobile phones had run out of charge, 24 hours. And I was forced, he said, to sit with my family members, with my sisters and brothers together for the first time. And he said, you know what? I really discovered my brothers and sisters were really very nice people. So what is the solution? And I'm trying to lead to the Islamic solution. Somebody could say, the solution is for the father to set military rules in the family. Set military rules. That's the solution. Some people say that. Okay? Children will find workarounds. You remember we're talking about happiness, right? I'm talking about happiness and uh, if we find solution to our problems, we will be happier people. That's why I'm addressing that. So I'm addressing some problems and I'm leading you to the way how Islam tells us to solve them. So that father said, 
he passed a military rule in the family. Okay, every day for 15 minutes, from this time to that time, all of the children go down to the living room and the whole family sit together. Compulsory, <clears throat> no negotiations. In the first day that this was supposed to be implemented, he could not come home in time, but he gave military orders to his children, even if I'm not here, you go, all of you, and sit with your mother in the living room. All of you. Everybody's in his room, busy with his own mobile. I'm going to stop that. So on the first day for implementing that military rule came, he called his wife. And he said, are the children with you? She said, yes. He said, they're, they're around you in the living room? She said, yes. He said, how many of them are around you? She looked at them and said, three iPhones and two Samsungs. They still found a way around. So, what does Islam tell us? How do we address this problem the Islamic way? I'm going to address to you a problem that existed during the time of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with one of the teenagers that was far bigger problem than this. And how Prophet Muhammad وسلم, solved it. The way to solve that problem is in talking to their minds Talk to their minds in a way that they will understand. Try to convince them. It might take time, but that's the only way. Islam tells us, talk to their mind. This is what Islam tells us. Listen to that story, and then you can extrapolate from that. One time, while the Prophet was in the masjid, a teenager came to him, and he said, Messenger of Allah, in front of everybody in the masjid, he said, Please allow me to practice zina. Please allow me to practice fornication. The Sahaba wanted to come and jump all over him. He said, no, 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 stay, stay, stay. The Prophet went to the young man and sat so close to him. Sat so close to him. And he was talking to him in a way that would address what goes inside his mind. He said, would you like for that to happen to your own mother? Someone who likes fornication to come and practice fornication with your own mother. He said, messenger of Allah, fidaka nafsi, fidaka nafsi meaning in Arabic, you're dearer to me than my own soul. No, I would never accept that to my mother. He said, similarly, people would not accept it to their mothers. Would you accept that to your sister? He said, the messenger of Allah, dearer to me than my own soul. I would never accept that for my sister. He said, and similarly, people do not accept that for their sisters. He said, would you accept that for your father's sister? He said, messenger of Allah, I would never accept that to happen to my father's sister, Ammati. He said, do you accept that to happen that لخالتك, to your mother's sister? for somebody to go and practice fornication with her just because he wants to. He said, Messenger of Allah, no way, I would never accept that for my mother's sister. He said, and similarly, people do not accept that for themselves. And then the, 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 the Prophet got closer to him to make him feel his love and his affection. Talk to the mind and let your teenage child realize your love and affection. Both together, both together, both together. Then the Prophet وسلم, put his hand on the head or the chest of the young man and he made the following dua to him. He said, Allah, please forgive his sins, purify and cleanse his heart, and safeguard him from zina, and safeguard him from the sin of fornication. The end of the hadith states that after that dialogue with Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the young man had never thought of zina after that. There was nothing that that young man hated more than zina. So the solution 
to some of the problems, the addictions to internet or mobile phones or other bad habits that your children have must come with two ways. One, talk to them in a way that they would understand. Go to the level of their age. Two, try to, to see what goes on their mind and try to convince them. So the, the type of speech and then the content of speech. The type of speech and the content of speech. And none of that works if you do not do like Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to make your son feel your love and affection. They go together. Islam, the complete way of life, teaches us how to happily raise our children. Islam, the complete way of life, teaches us how to be happy husbands, how to be happy wives, and how to be happy parents. If we analyze Islam in its totality, we can extract the following lessons. The way to change your teenage son or daughter's thinking the way to change him or her for the better comes through changing the following six things in him. Comes through changing the following six things in him. And now each one of those would have to be addressed according to the psychology of your own child, to the personality of your own child, to the circumstances of your own child, to the age of your own child, etc., etc., etc. But remember those six things. If you change his convictions, so many of the things that we see our children falling into is that they want to imitate the Western culture, in the good and in the bad. We don't mind to imitate another culture in the good things. We don't mind. We Muslims take the good wherever it exists. We don't mind. But we mind and we reject that we imitate other cultures in the bad things. We must teach them that not everything in the Western culture suits us. That there are certain things that we totally must reject. So we have to change his convictions. We have to change his thoughts. To make them correct Islamic thoughts. We have to change his interests in life. What is he interested in? If you find him interested in just locking himself inside the room and always busy with WhatsApp and Facebook and whatever, try to cleverly change his interests. Maybe engage him in certain sports or other things without making him feel that you're forcing that interest on him. It requires wisdom. It comes through changing his skills. A lot of times our children do certain things out of frustration that they're not skilled for anything. We send them to schools who stuff their minds with, with books and reading and reading and reading and reading. No skills. When the child feels that he has the skills to deal with life, he will behave differently. When you manage to enable him to change his set examples in life, who are his role models? Are they Madonna and Maradona? Or are they Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umar ibn Khattab, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, those heroes of Islam. And then one very important thing, and I'll say that to conclude my khutbah with it today. Enable them to have a positive influence on others. Develop that skill in them. In this life, you cannot escape being one of those two. You either influence others or you get influenced by them. There is no escape in this life. So qualify your child to be able to positively influence others with our moral values and to be able to positively represent himself. Islam, the complete way of life, provides us with the way to happily raise our children. 
not only guides parents to the best way of upbringing their children, but also guides children to the best way of respecting, honoring their parents, and being dutiful to them. Dear parents, I say this statement, and I end my khutbah with it. The fact that Allah has made you a parent, that does not necessarily mean that you are a qualified parent. Listen to that. The fact that Allah has made you a parent, that does not mean that you are a qualified parent. And Islam tells us that we must pursue knowledge in everything in our life to become good and knowledgeable Muslims. There is no religion in the whole world that orders its followers to pursue knowledge like the religion of Islam. I hope that out of this khutbah, so many of us can pick up maybe one or just two points where they go back home and correct certain things in the way that they are dealing with their children. Remember, Islam, the complete way of life, helps us to happily raise our children.